God, you are so good. And Lord, your love, your mercy, and your power are just amazing. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom that you give us. Thank you, Lord, for, for the sacrifice that freed us and that broke the chains of our sin. We pray that you would just be with us today and that you would just speak your word to us. In thy holy name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to welcome you to Heartland Community Church this morning. If you're new, if you're visiting with us today, if you're a guest, there's a card probably right in front of you somewhere in a, in a chair underneath. Grab one of those, fill it out, put, drop it in the offering plate or pass it to one of the ushers later on. We'd love to get to know you, get to meet you, get to, to, to know why you came here today. And uh, we, we want to be able to serve you. I want to mention a few things going on in the next uh, few weeks. So, so uh, you can know all the things that are going on here at Heartland. <clears throat> Today, after the service, Chris Ernie is going to be taking some pictures. I, I know a lot of you have already posed for pictures, and it might seem, seem a while ago, but we're finally wrapping up the directory. And, and uh, Chris wants to take pictures of those that might not have been able to be in the directory yet. So if you can see, see Chris afterwards, wait for him. Yeah, so, so see, see that guy after the service to, to, to get in the directory. Also, next week at, at our house, right over there in the White House, uh, right beside the church, is, is our open house. We're going to have our open house right over there and have some cookies. Uh, Jenny is specifically making some pumpkin chocolate chip cookies and some sugar cookies. She doesn't make the sugar cookies very often. So just, you don't want to miss it. Let's just say that. Uh, <laughs> come over to our house, hang out for a little bit, and, and, and just prolong the, 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 the friendship and fellowship uh, time uh, where we normally do after the service. So after that, uh, the following week, two weeks from today, is the Christmas tea. Now, th this is a community effort. The, the lay people from all churches uh, combine on that, and it rotates from church to church every year. This year, it's going to be at Heartland. And, and as far as I know, since I've been in LaPorte City, there's never been tea at it. And, and, and this year, there's going to be tea. So just, just FYI, if we're going to advertise Christmas tea, we're going to be serving tea. We'll, we'll, we'll have some non, uh, so some decaf for those that want to fall asleep afterwards, but we'll have some caffeinated too for, for those that, that want caffeinated. But we will serve tea and all kinds of other stuff. So uh, if you're interested in helping out with that, please uh, let Florence know. Also, the week following that, which is a few weeks out, is the potluck. This is the second best potluck of the year, for, for in, in my mindset, because the first one's the breakfast one we do every Easter. This, this is the, my, my second favorite one, but it's, it's just a, one of those different atmospheres. We have uh, people hosting tables, and, and we, we need hosts. So if, if you want to host a table, please sign up on the back. We're going to have at least 12 uh, hosts for that. Um, and so, so a host means you decorate the table in, in, in your Christmas uh, decor and, and nice plates instead of our normal styrofoam plates that we have uh, for, for a potluck or, or something like that. So, so it's going to be a lot of fun, so please come out to the potluck, but also we will need 12 hosts uh, for the potluck. Also, one of the things that we've been talking about at, uh, and can I get that change around? I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling like that's, it, it seems weird to me, but uh, it, we've been talking about at the board meetings uh, the last couple months is pub theology. We're, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to do, do kind of a, a group in, 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 at PNB pubs. Uh, so, so me and Jeff are leading that. And, and if you have any friends that not necessarily connected with a church, this is going to be a way to connect them uh, with a church. That, that, that's our whole goal is to, to, to build bridges. And I've already talked to 
uh, I don't know, a handful plus of people that are already interested in coming. I, I have another guy who, who's a neighbor of mine who doesn't live too far away, and, and he said he's already invited six other people. Like, it, it, it's already building up steam. So I'm really excited. People that would never step foot inside of a church are, are, are interested about this group. So, so please be in prayer uh, for this group. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited, and I know Jeff is uh, too. But that's going to be uh, December third that's going to be our first thing we're just going to meet once a month and uh we're excited we're excited uh to start up something like this so with that i'm going to ask the ushers to to please come forward and uh we'll we'll uh pray for our tithes and offerings lord you are so good to me and and this church heartland you you have blessed us in so many ways so we want to just thank you we want to thank you for providing for us, protecting us, and taking care of us. And, and, and we want to just say thank you. We want to be able to give back to you. So during this time, we, we just want to say thank you. In your name, amen. The board's been busy a couple, couple months, last couple months, and we've made a decision, which is pretty cool. And, and I get to, to make that announcement uh, today. Uh, in February, we're going to have a group come uh, from the district and, and uh, one uh, DS in, from New York, actually. And he's going to come. They're going to come and we're, we're going to send them a report beforehand. They're going to they're find out everything there is to know about this church. And then they're going to come February 19th, 20th, and 21st, and they're going to dig even deeper. So on the 19th, they're going to interview me and Jenny. They're going to interview the board. They're going to interview different leaders on the 20th, which is that Saturday. They're going to interview more people. They're going to um, have a, a session on, on being a healthy and, and, and growing church, which I think we know a little bit about, but I think we want to take it a little bit deeper, right? We, we want to be a better church. We want to love people more. We want to reach more people. We want, we want to reach out to Laporte City the best way we know how. And, and these are some leaders that know exactly how to do it. Paul James is, is, is a DS in, in, in New York, and he's done consultations all over his, his uh, district and, and, and outside districts. It, it's going into the, the Atlantic District, which is my home church. In fact, my home church had the consultation last Last week, and I can't wait to, to see what happens uh, to them over the next few weeks so I can bring that here and, and let you know what, what happens in, in my home church that, uh, that I grew up in. But uh, they're going to come and, and just share with us more. And then on Sunday, they're, they're going to, after investing all that time into interviewing you guys and, and reading this report on the church, they're, they're, they're going to share with us some things that they think they can take our church to the next level. And, and I'm so excited ab about this. So mark it on your calendars as, as a weekend that you don't want to plan anything else. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So February 19th, 20th, and 21st, mark your calendars and say, I've got church stuff that weekend. Don't plan family stuff. If you're, if, 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 since, since it's a weekend after Valentine's Day, make sure you get in Valentine's Day beforehand. Make, make your honey feel like a, your, her sweetheart. You know, like just butter up before that because that weekend is going to be, I think, a catalyst for Harlan Community Church. And we've been taught, T Tim Purcell came, came to our board meeting this past Tuesday. And he, he just really wanted to pat us on the back for it. Because not many churches go, go, go outside and, and look to a, to a, a consultant when, when, when they're actually growing, right? Because we want, we want to do more things for, for God's kingdom. So, so we're, we're, we're going to bring these people in and, and we're going to set a standard for, for our district too. That, 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 that's one of the things that, that Tim is excited about, you know, our church, 
but also our district because we're setting an example for the rest of the churches. And he wants this to, to, to be a catalyst, to, to, to be a momentum, to, to be a movement that, that just really changes not only Laporte City, but the district of Iowa and Minnesota. So I'm excited to, to bring that announcement to you guys today that that is something uh, the board's been talking about the last uh, couple months, five weeks, six weeks, and uh, we, we've uh, met this past week on and, and agreed to do. So I'm excited about that. But today we're also going to talk about end commandments. End commandments were kind of neck deep right now. We, we've been waiting for the last few weeks and we're getting deeper and deeper into the End Commandments, which is a series out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia and Andy Stanley's uh, church, North Point. I've, I've been telling you a little bit about his church and about 30,000 people. One thing I, I realized this week is that they're the biggest church in America, which, which just is astounding to me. They, 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 they actually average 35,000 people on a given weekend. So, so I, I've been learning a lot from Andy Stanley. In fact, uh, the board a couple years ago wrote, read, read a book by Andy Stanley and, and we're just wanting to, to, to continue to learn about the End Commandments. So the last few weeks we've talked about fearing not, we've talked about worrying not, and we've talked last week about doubt not. Now this is one of those things that we kind of look at and we're like, what? Like, these, these are hard commandments because even the disciples hand, handled these things in, in, in a weird way because they didn't, I think, fully understand what they meant until after Jesus died and, and he rose again, that he defeated death. And then things actually started to click for them. Now, today's topic is sin not. To take it to the next level, now, a lot of people, a lot of people say they don't want to come to church because they don't feel comfortable in the church, that maybe people know them from their past and they, 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 they say, well, they'll never accept me for, for how I am. They, they, they will never forgive me for, for, for my past or, or God will never take me in and he won't forgive me my sins. Now, Unfortunately, th this is the case, but God will accept you wherever you are at, bring you in and say, come alongside me and we'll journey on this path together. We're going to be talking about one of those people that probably never felt comfortable in a church this morning. And, and please turn to John 8 or you can read it up here on, on, on the screen in front of you. But John 8 talks about a lady that probably did not feel comfortable entering into the tabernacle, or if she lived today, she probably would not feel comfortable walking into a church. So please join me on, on the uh, even verses of John 8, 1 through 11. It says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made... Sorry, I lost my place. Uh, they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? There, we're using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who began heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. 
then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. May he op you open our eyes and our hearts, our ears, and our mind to what you have to say to us. May we let it sink in, learn to believe it, and follow it, Lord, in your name. Amen. Now the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, brought this woman into the temple courts, basically dragging her from wherever they, they, they caught her in the act of adultery. Now, chances are it had been a few hours since they caught her, and they kept her somewhere overnight. But also, she probably does not have clothes on, so she's probably a spectacle in the middle of the temple courts that she was dragged there. She was brought somewhere that she did not want to go. This is a horrible place to be, right? <laughs> you know, being in a place that you don't want to go. Maybe some of you guys have experienced that. You, you were dragged to a place that you didn't want to go. Maybe, maybe you were dragged here this morning. This is church. I, 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 I know when I was growing up, there were Sundays that I didn't necessarily want to go to church. Now, if I miss, some, somebody would be like, where, where's the pastor? You know, like, that, 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 that would be different. But I'm, I'm sure some of you have been dragged to church or somewhere that you did not want to go. The thing is, sin does that. Sin takes you places that you don't want to go, that you never thought or dreamed of ever going in your life. And, and the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, dragged this woman in front of everybody because this, this is basically public space. People are going around doing the things that they do in the temple courts on a regular basis. You see, a lot of people would climb up the south stairs and they would go into the temple courts, which was kind of basically a courtyard of type. And, and, and on one side, there was the Holy of Holies probably over here. And, and then on one side, there were sacrifices going on over there. And, and, and People were bringing in their sacrifices to be forgive, given their sins. And here the Pharisees are dragging someone else because of their sins, basically saying that we're going to sacrifice her because of what she has done. But they were doing this not because even the woman had sinned, but they were doing this to trap Jesus. They, they could have cared less about the woman. They weren't making a, a spectacle of her. They wanted to make a spectacle of Jesus. But they didn't care who got in their way to do it. In other words, they had no remorse. They had no care. They had no compassion for this woman. She was just an end to a means, right? Means to an end. She, so they were using her to get to Jesus, and they were trying to trap him. The thing is, like, why, why were they trying to trap Jesus? What were they trying to get out of him? You know, they, they were trying to get him to say that, that he was the Christ, that he is God, right? To, to trap him and blaspheme him so, so, so they could get rid of him. And they were trying to bring this, this law up that you were to stone the women caught, caught in adultery, except they misinterpreted this law. So, so when they misinterpreted this law, they, they, they said, they stoned this woman, but when they sto misinterpreted the law, what they did is basically saying that, because the Romans would not let them carry out this death sentence. You see, Romans were in charge right now. And they would not let the Jewish faith carry out death sentences because of what the, their law said. Also, on top of that, you know, Jesus would have to make a choice between God and the Romans. But he's been in situations like this before, and he always comes out the victor, right? So, so he's not going to be railroaded into anything. But basically, they misinterpreted what the scripture said. 
See, the, what the law said back then was it was supposed to be a betrothed virgin. In, in, in other ways, if a betrothed virgin uh, committed adultery, then she should be sentenced to death and along with the person that was being caught in adultery with her. See, they, they sh could have brought the guy too, but for some reason, they just brought the woman. Why? Why? Just to get to Jesus. Try to trap him so they could kill him. Where is that man? Why, why did they just bring this woman? Some scholars think that the guy was in on it. That he set her up that he was willing to have an affair with this woman so that they could take her to Jesus. Some, some scholars think that, I don't know, maybe. And maybe that's above my pay grade because we don't know that, right? Like, so, so in verse 6, Jesus hears this question and, and, and he starts to think about it. And in, instead of giving an answer right away, he stoops down and he starts writing in the sand. And I don't know what he was writing. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I wish they told us. It would answer a lot of questions. Some, some people think he maybe he was writing a line. Maybe what he was doing was trying to get in between the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and the woman so they couldn't get to her. Maybe he was writing the different sins of each of the different Pharisees bringing her to them. We don't know. We, we have no idea. There's no possible way we could think about it all day long about the different things Jesus wrote and we'd probably be wrong. Maybe he was just writing his name, you know, like, you know, making the little smiley faces or whatever. I, I, I don't know. But one way or the other, Jesus really sets a good example right here. He pauses. He, he, he allows this tension to build. And, and the Pharisees keep on asking, Jesus, give us an answer. What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to stone this woman for her sins? Are we supposed to act on it? And he doesn't say anything. But then he stands up. And I think with a little bit of a pause and a little bit of a slow drawl, starts to talk. And this is what he says. If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Wow. That got him thinking, right? Think about that. If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he went back to writing in the sand. Right? That's what he was doing, writing in the sand. And I still ask myself, what was he writing in the sand? What, what could have been so important that he felt like he had to write in the sand? Because this, this is the only time that Jesus ever wrote in the sand that we know of, that, that was written about in Scripture. The interesting thing with that line is that the only one who had no sin also had no stone in his hand. And when they heard this, each one of them dropped the stone one by one and walked away. Why? Because they knew that they had sin in their lives. They knew that, that, that their accusing this woman meant really nothing. And, and, and I think, think it was interesting that it says the older ones did it first. Maybe there was some wisdom there. Maybe they realized that they were in the wrong. And the older ones said, we need to do this. We need to, need to leave. They set the example for the younger ones, right? Because usually the older ones in, in a lot of these situations are the leaders. And they, they led the way by dropping the stone and walking away. And eventually, however many, walked away. And it was just Jesus and, and this woman. Now, we don't know much about this woman. 
we, we hardly know anything except she was caught in adultery. We don't know her age. We don't know her name. We don't know her nationality or, or, or ethnicity. We have no idea about her. And Jesus turns to her and says, Woman, woman where are they? Has no one condemned you? And her only three words that she says during this whole story, he sa she says, no one, sir. And then Jesus says some of the most powerful words, I think, in history. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. In other words, sin not. Leave your life of of sin. Wow. Can someone actually do that? Is that possible? Can you leave your life of sin? Can you leave it behind and, and go on to something new? Oh wait, that was exactly what Jesus was about his whole ministry. To leave something. To leave the old behind and to have a new life. To be made new. That is his teaching. That is what the resurrection was. He was dead and now he's alive. He is made new. And, and each and every one of us can be made new in, in a new resurrection, in a new life. We don't have to wait for heaven, although then we'll have our real resurrection, right? We'll, we'll, we'll have two resurrections, a new life spiritually and a, and a new life physically, right? We'll, our, our bodies will be resurrected. What I think Jesus was saying, though, to this woman, neither do I condemn you. I think he was saying, you've lived quite the life. You've probably punished yourself enough. You've probably condemned yourself enough. You know you're wrong. You know you're not supposed to be living this type of life. Why do I need to condemn you too? You condemn yourself enough for the, the lives you've been, been, you've been living here. You, you've punished yourself enough and you've probably ran your mind all the way through it and, and, and you're killing yourself. You're, you're, you're damaging yourself, and I want you to have something new, something different, completely different. He's basically saying, don't be defined by the life you used to live. Be defined by something new. You are not defined by your sin. You are not defined by your past. You are better without it. You are better without your sin. You see, your sin destroys you. And this is why sin breaks the heart of God, not just because it's disobeying him, but because he sees his child making poor decisions. Have you ever seen your child make poor decisions? Teddy makes a lot of poor decisions. He's, he's three, so he gets away with most of it. But when you see your child make poor decisions, it, it, it's not just about them disobeying you. It's about them not protecting them from, from, from the harm that, that, that is coming to them, the harm that is damaging their lives. And as Teddy grows older, he's going to be able to make more decisions that can actually harm more than just himself or, 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 and, and the people around him. It, it can, can damage real people. Sin can damage people. Sin kills. I think... This week, more than any, we know this. Maybe you heard about the pastor's wife in Indiana. Davy Blackburn is a pastor in Indiana for, for Resonate Church. And, and I, according to Facebook, I know 26 people that know him personally. You know, like this, this isn't something that just hits close to home. This is something that my friends are dealing with the loss of their friend. 
and sin kills. Someone walked into their house while Davy was at the gym and decided to, to, to take some stuff, but he didn't realize Amanda was there and, and decided to, 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 to kill her, right? Shoot her or just protect himself, right? Sin kills. And of course, then, then, then on, on Friday night, I think it was, Paris, you know, sin kills. Sin destroys lives and livelihoods and, 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 and it's sad. And God, I'm sure, is looking down on, on those things that is, is happening and it breaks his heart, not just because people are disobeying him, but because lives are being destroyed. Families are, are mourning and, and pain and wailing are, are happening because it's horrific. Sin destroys. Sin destroys our identity, right? Sin destroys everything that, that, that God is trying to, to, to reassure us of. And it happened even since the beginning. The first people that came to this planet, right? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were told not to eat from the fruit in the middle of the garden of this tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were told not to. Why? Because God was trying to protect them. He was trying to protect them from this. And when they ate of it, their image of themselves changed. They were naked and they realized something that they were naked. In other words, shame was opened up into their life, something completely different that they had experienced before because of their, their disobedience of God, this, this image, this, the, this idea of who they were, that they were now naked in front of each other, so they were shamed. They, they, they were guilty. So what did they do? They, they decided to they make clothes to cover up their nakedness. And then when God came into the garden, they heard him, they hid. They were scared of God because their new image, their, their idea, perception of who they were in front of God had changed. He still saw them as children, but he saw them as people that have changed in a way that he was disappointed. He wanted better for them. He wanted more for them than they wanted even for themselves. So what he does, he banishes from the garden because he wants to protect them from the other tree, the tree that provides eternal life. Because the combination of the knowledge of good and evil and eternal life are, would cause havoc among men and, and, and women, the children of God. They just couldn't be able to handle it. So he tosses them out of the garden. Fast forward to, to this woman who was caught in adultery. Can you imagine her, her perception of herself? The, the image that she thought she had, her identity. Her identity was, was basically caught up in, in men. Men who happened to be married. Maybe she was married herself, but she was caught up in, 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 in this place that she was living a lie. She was trying to be with someone else's other husband. She, she was caught up in, and missed her identity and who God created her to be. Fast forward a little bit further where Jesus actually dies on the cross. He, he takes the sin of the world, the sin that, uh, of that adulterous woman, that sin of Adam and Eve, and he takes it and all those other sins. And he bears it on his shoulders and, and, and he's crucified on the cross. Not just their sins, but your sins, the future sins of the world that, that would eventually come. And he surrendered his life, sacrificed his life for all sin. And he said, now it's up to you guys to go leave your life of sin, to live a new life. Jesus gave us a new reason. 
not to sin. Not because there's going to be a punishment, but because there's going to be so much more. A life of, of love. A life of peace. A life of strength. A life of, of so much more. A life of getting your identity back to actually know who you can be when Christ actually lives inside of you. That's what God wants for you. He wants so much more for you. And here is the woman hearing these words to go and sin no more. And, and I couldn't imagine what's going on in her head. Here's a guy that's actually treating her like a human being who's actually talking to her and cares about her rather than just her body. And Jesus is offering her grace, someone who's probably never been really offered grace before. And, and in this final thought, what do you do when someone like Jesus in your life offers you grace? What do you do? So many people don't understand the idea of grace because they think, now God will never accept me. He will never love me the way I am. I'll never step in foot of, of a church because they'll never accept me. They'll never love me. They'll never let me belong or, or I will never feel welcome there. And I'm sure that woman felt that same way. But what do you do when someone gives you grace? I hope you accept it. I hope you take it into your life. I hope it, it, you let it change you. Because that's what God has been trying to do since the beginning of time. To offer his children grace. To offer his children love. To, to bring them in side by side and say, I'm there for you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be there every step of the way. I hope you receive it. And I hope you say thank you. Because it's the best gift anybody could ever give. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And if you've never received forgiveness, if you've never said, I'm okay with being offered grace, if I, it's, it's, it's the hardest thing to actually accept, right? You don't have to do anything to earn his love. You don't have to do anything. Just accept it. Take it in and say thank you. Altars will be open at this time if that's something you feel like you need to do to be able to say, I surrender. Open my life up to this grace. Open up my life to, to what you've given this adulterous woman to, to start a new life, to, to be brand spanking new, to, 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 to get that mess washed away. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and say thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for that offer of grace, that grace that we all need. We all need to accept. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this gift of grace. We praise you in your name. Amen. Go make a choice. Go live a new life because the world needs people that live new life. Next week, we're going to figure out what to do with that grace. Not only do we receive it, but we give it, right? So next week, we'll come back and we'll talk about that. But this week, go love God, love others, serve all. And if you haven't had your picture taken for the directory, see Chris. <laughs>